Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, This is We Atheists and Agnostics, and I'm going to start out by reading the preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, as such, I'm going to read the anonymity statement. Whenever I have to say anonymity in public, I get nervous, so bear, bear that in mind, please. <laughs> there may be some here who are not familiar with our tradition of personal anonymity at the public level. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Thus, we respectfully ask that AA speakers and AA members not be photographed, videotaped, or identified by full name on audio tapes and in published or broadcast reports of our meetings, including those reports on the Internet. The assurance of anonymity is the essential in our efforts to help other problem drinkers who may wish to share their recovery program with us. And our tradition of anonymity reminds us that AA principles come before personalities. A further note about anonymity. Out of respect for others, please do not take photography or video during any of these meetings at Ikipa. Also, be considerate when taking photographs or video inside and outside the hotel. Take care that you do not capture images of AA members, family members, and friends who do not give permission and may not wish to appear in your pictures or videos. Please do not post recognizable photos or videos of identifiable AA members on the web with ac- accessible to the public, including unrestricted pages on social networking sites. Um, we've invited three panelists here to talk about their experience navigating uh, through recovery um, as either atheists or agnostics, or however they choose to identify themselves. Um, our first panelist is Steve from Burlington, Vermont. I guess that's me. Yep. <laughs> uh, so I'm Steve, and I'm an alcoholic. And I am also from Burlington, Vermont. Uh, my sobriety date is July 21st, 2006, and my home group is the Design for Living group. It meets every Thursday at 21 Beale Street in Burlington, Vermont. So, a couple fans back there. <laughs> and I heard that, Jesse. Yes, he did start it. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about myself so you can understand that I do qualify as an alcoholic and uh, where I stand with the whole spirituality. I'll tell you right from the start. Uh, I am the belligerent one. Um, I'll also tell you that I'm probably going to swear, and it's good to be at a young person's conference because I've had some old people come up to me before and tell me that the swearing inhibits my message, and I don't really give a fuck. Um, (laughs) I like to swear. Uh, So anyway, like I said, I'm the belligerent one. Um, So I grew up in the suburbs, up in Vermont. It's uh, not quite like this. But it's not quite what you would think either, though. It's kind of in between. Uh, There's kind of a joke about Burlington that says, you know, it's a a really nice place. It's almost like Vermont, you know, because it's it's strange. You know, it's like five colleges, like a little, you know, kind of community with, like, some actual culture, you know, surrounded by cow shit and fields, basically, Um, just like you would expect of Vermont. But anyway, I grew up there, and uh, I can't really complain about, you know, my upbringing, You know, my parents did their best. They really did. Um, But I think just like, you know, the rest of you in here, like, I was a handful. Like, I was was kind of a a 
belligerent asshole little piece of shit kid you know and uh it was just it's in my nature it's my makeup you know it's what it's what got me here you know um i've always just really kind of hated myself really bad and i took it out on everybody else um you know i found alcohol just like a lot of people in this room probably and uh that became my solution to that problem for years and years until it stopped working and uh then i figured out that i had to get sober and that's where the real problem arose um because I didn't really want to turn to God um, at all. You know, and this is uh, my second step experience is kind of um, real basic and quick, so I'll try to extend it. I probably won't be able to fill 20 minutes with it, but that's okay. Um, but really, like, you know, like I said, like, I'm the belligerent one. I was the one who had the faith and lost it. You know, like, I remember being a little kid, you know, like six years old, and, like, going to church. Uh, with my family, I grew up uh, Irish Catholic, you know, so we would go to Mass all the time, once a week, and I got confirmed when I was 13, I did the whole catechism and all that stuff, and, you know, towards the end, like after I was like seven or eight, it was kind of just running through the motions, but it wasn't really all that bad, but when I was young, like I was actually into it, you know, like I was a little kid, and I would like actually had faith, and uh, I remember there's like two real distinct um, things that happened in my life, one I didn't realize till much later, and uh, the other one I realized when it happened. Um, the first one, I remember we were, because uh, my original church when I was a little, little kid, my priest actually taught me to ride my bicycle. Like a really, really sweet old man. His name was Father Moses. Taught me to ride my bike. Gave me some ice cream afterwards. Didn't touch me inappropriately. You know, it was a really nice relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then uh, my mother, who was actually Lutheran, decided to convert over to Catholicism uh, for my father. And um, so... Uh, in the process, like, I didn't realize, like, what had happened at the time, and I still, like, I've never, um, I've never asked her, because it's not my place to ask her, you know, she'll tell me uh, if it's ever appropriate to tell me, but something happened, basically, between her and our priest, not Father Moses, but Father Moore, our second priest, where we stopped going to that church, and uh, wouldn't walk through those doors, you know, I don't know if he touched her inappropriately, or made a pass at her, or something, but he did something, and I could tell, like, there was, the dynamic shifted, between my family and the church. She continued going on and, you know, got confirmed and, you know, we just went to a different church and everything. I didn't realize at the time that that was probably the start of, like, the break in my faith and, like, moving away from it, you know, and shutting the doors on organized religion. But in looking back, you know, it it is now. It was definitely on my four-step list, you know, resentment against the church for that and against that priest in particular. Um, But then I remember uh, further down the line, when I was like 16, 17 years old, this was what I, uh, I actually brought this up to my sponsor um, in doing my fifth step, the reason that I was going to go to hell. Um, I remember I was, uh, I was driving my car through this graveyard, tripping on acid, and, um, <laughs> and my car starts doing one of these things, and like I don't have hydraulics, and uh, it starts like bouncing like a hoopty, and like I look to the side, and there's a row of gravestones going right by my wheels. And I'm basically like, I'd gone off the road at some point. I don't remember when. I was tripping. I thought I was still on the road. My headlights were off, you know. And uh, I'm driving over, like, just a row of, like, hundreds of graves, you know. And so I figured, like, from that point on, you know, like, I had enough faith at the time to know that, like, that was pretty bad stuff. I might as well have, like, you know, killed a puppy with a baseball bat or something. And, uh, you know, I was like... I'm done, you know, like really, like what's the point from here on out, you know, it's like I'm not gonna, you know, I don't believe in like, I guess I believed enough in like the, you know, the stupid sacraments to know that I wasn't gonna go seek confession, so I was gonna go to hell for that, so I might as well just go for it, you know, so that was like, when you when you take like, you know, a, a piece of crap, like alcoholic, like super thief, I should mention that I'm a gigantic thief, I've only met a couple of people who are bigger thieves than me, so when you take a, a piece of crap like that, and then you give him license to just do whatever the hell he wants to do anyway, I mean, all bets are off. You know, I was like a 16, 17-year-old kid, and just like from then on, it was like off and running, you know. Um, I had no morals, no morals. You know, I would do anything to anyone at any time. And uh, it brought me to some some interesting places, to say the least. If I had been living down here, it probably would have brought me to some even more interesting places, but... There's some interesting places up in Burlington, Vermont as well, and I went to just about every one of them, probably created a couple of them. Um, So anyway, uh, back to my second step. Um, That's the kind of mentality that I had coming into this thing. You know, like I came in and like 
I'm sitting in the back of the rooms. I'm not getting anything out of it. I'm pissed off all the time. I'm looking up here. Everyone's happy. You know, everyone's getting better. You know, I mean, granted, not everyone was getting better. There were the other guys who were hanging out with me in the back. They're just as miserable as me, womanizing and, you know, going off and doing their things, selling drugs and sobriety and shit like that. You know, the, the crazy stuff we do in the back of the room. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, like a year later, like I'm still crazy and I'm still sick and I'm, I'm still in a lot of pain. And, uh, you know, luckily, uh, I think, you know, my second step started... Probably the same way, like a lot of people's second step started. Uh, definitely the same way, like that Bill's second step started. You know, because when I go back, if I rewind to like 17, um, one of the kids that was in that car with me when I was tripping on acid driving through the graveyard got sober about a month later, and he hasn't had a drink since. You know, like we didn't like hang out much after that point <laughs> because he was sober, but I knew. You know, like I knew that whole time since I was 17 that this kid who I used to hang out with had been sober, you know, and he left, you know, completely, like, just left, you know, like, we never talked with him again, you know, um, well, I mean, I talked to him a couple times since then, but not until I got into sobriety, we become, you know, closer friends again, you know, and then, you know, I have my cousin, who used to be this, like, 100-pound soaking wet junkie, who used to, steal, used to uh, sell me stolen bikes, and uh, he got sober uh, through, through the, the 12 steps, and uh, he became, like, I think either, like, three or four-time uh, Vermont State Golden Glove champion, you know, and it's like now he's like a, you know, upstanding member of society. He's got a master's degree and a wife and a child, you know, and he's got like 11 years sobriety now, you know. So it's like I had these these people in my life, you know, like I'm fortunate. I think, you know, like all of us are, are amazingly fortunate to be sitting in this room and not out there when you when you look at the numbers involved. But, you know, these are these are my certain circumstances of of how I'm fortunate, you know, like of where I was positioned, you know, and uh, to have these men in my life, you know, just like. Like Bill sitting across the table from Ebby, you know, like for me it was it was my cousin, you know, it was it was Mark, you know, and uh, it left it, it it left it open just a crack, you know, just enough to investigate, you know, and to uh, when I when I did get to that point, um, when uh, you know when I met my sponsor, and uh, I'll try not to cry here. I usually cry when I talk about the night that I met my sponsor because you know I was in a lot of pain, you know, I really was, and. Uh, um, I went to this meeting, and uh, I'd never been to this meeting before. It's, a, it's called a candlelight meeting. It meets at like 10 o'clock in Burlington. Um, wouldn't necessarily suggest going to it, but I did meet my sponsor there. <laughs> but he was all pissed off, and I was all pissed off, and uh, I didn't know it at the time. You know, like, like that's why they say, like, you know, you, your sponsor doesn't know how unqualified you are. Like, I didn't know how this guy was unqualified. He, you know, like, he was qualified enough, you know. <laughs> He had at least a little bit of a message. I didn't know like that he himself was almost as crazy as me, but he's covered in tattoos, big plugs in his ears, shaved head, and you know me like I grew up in a mosh pit, getting my ass handed to me. So like I kind of can identify with this guy, looking all pissed off, and I'm like, okay, you know, like this guy looks like a punker like me. Like I can talk with this guy. Turns out he's like a hippie, you know, but um, <laughs> he listens to like the disco biscuits and shit. But uh, <laughs> but here he is, like standing in the corner, you know, and and. Uh, and, you know, the one thing he shared at the end of the meeting was, was you know, the, what, what makes me uncomfortable is when I come to a meeting like this and I don't hear any, any hope or any solution, you know. Like, we're supposed to be here to offer that solution to the man who still needs it, you know. And, like, and for that day, like, that was me. You know, like, I was the person, the most important person in the room that day. That was me, you know. And, uh, and I picked it up that day. You know, like, there was enough of a crack from the, the men that were in my life to make me think that maybe something here would work. You know, and then to sit down with him and to have him explain it a little bit further that I didn't need to believe in that God. You know, I didn't need to believe in the, you know, the guy with the big white beard throwing lightning bolts down from a cloud because, you know, fuck that God, man. You know, you know, like I told him to stick it when I was like eight years old. You know, like I'm not going back to him. You know, like like he's got nothing for me. You know, and uh, um, I still remember, you know, like uh, that day when I was finally broken down enough, you know, to like, Said we'd been reading for a little bit, you know, and I'd, I'd actually, you know, when I first got sober, like, you know, a year prior to this, like, I picked up the big book and read the whole damn thing, you know, like, I'm a reader, you know, like, I, I can do that, you know, and, uh, and I read it, and I didn't get any, you know, recovery out of it, but, you know, so I, when I sit down with this man, I start reading it, we can get to the, you know, the third step, and, and I'm sitting in his living room, and I'm like, oh, man, you know, like, turn my will and my life over to God, like, what the fuck is going on here, like, this guy's crazy, you know, like he wants me to get down on my knees in his living room. It's creepy. I barely know the guy, you know, and it's like, you know, I'm like, I'm like, come on, you know, really? Like, 
I don't know. You know, and he, and he asked me the questions honestly. Like, can you turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand him? And I said, no. You know, like, I have to be honest. You know, it's a program of rigorous honesty. Like, I'm not going to start on a lie, and I can't because I don't understand God, and I have no God of my understanding, and and uh, I, I don't know how to do that. And uh, And he said, well... Do you believe it will work? Do you believe it could work for you? You know, just like it says in the A, B's and C's. I said, yes. Do you believe it will? And I said, not really, because I still think, you know, I'm going to hell for when I was 17 years old driving over those graves. I haven't worked a fifth step yet. You know, like I haven't gotten rid of that stuff yet. You know, I haven't done amends for that yet. You know, and, uh, and he's like, well, do you believe that I believe that you could get better if you work this program? You know, like the line that we've all heard so many goddamn times. And he didn't look like a liar. <laughs> you know, like luckily he didn't look like a liar. You know, thank God for good sponsorship. Thank God that he had enough light in his eyes that I could tell that he wasn't lying to me. And maybe he was just a deluded schmuck, but at least he wasn't lying. You know, like he actually did believe that it would work. So I said, yeah, man, I believe that you believe. I don't necessarily believe myself, but you look like you actually believe. So yeah, man. Jesse laughs because he knows the guy, you know, and... Uh, and, uh, you know, that was it. And he said, well, you know, um, will you make an agreement with me to work the rest of these steps to the best of your ability? You know, and uh, I said, yes. You know, and that was it. You know, that was the start. You know, I went home. I started writing. You know, very simply. It took the actions without the, without the belief, really, I guess. is a form of faith. I guess that's a form of faith to me. You know, like I don't need to, I don't need to know what the hell it is. You know, like, and I still don't. I have no conception of God. Like, I really don't. I still identify myself as an agnostic. I don't, you know, go by any religion. Like, I sat in St. Patrick's Cathedral about two hours ago, and it's beautiful, you know. But, like, I don't find any, like, deep spiritual connection there. It was nice and calming after hanging out in Times Square for a couple of days to go into a cathedral and kind of chill out and sit on a bench for a half an hour. But, like, I don't feel any more spiritual connection there than I do in Times Square. If anything, I feel it on top of a mountain in Vermont. You know, like, that's where I grew up. Like, that's my home, you know. But uh, it's wonderful to come in here. And to be told, and not only told, like, you know, in this kind of like bullshit upper level, but told by people who really believe it and really live it that you don't need that God. You know, you don't need that conception. I don't need a conception. You know, that was a drastic thing to me that I don't need a conception of God. Like, all I need to do is take the actions with no conception of why the hell I'm taking them, and I get the same damn results as all of you. You know, so I guess that's the message I have, you know, is that... uh doesn't matter if you believe or not, you know, if you take the actions, you'll get the results, you know, like if you, you know, put the ingredients together, you're going to get a damn pie, whether you thought you were baking a cake or not, you're still going to get a goddamn pie if those are the ingredients you use, (laughs) you know, so that's been my experience, so thanks a lot. I'm going to quickly interject here and say, uh, if we have time after the three panelists, we're going to we're going to open it up for sharing. And our next panelist is Steve from. Uh, I'm sorry, Dave from Portland, Oregon. I'm Dave. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety date is 2 12 I'm from uh, Portland, Oregon. You probably didn't know that from last night because they didn't call Oregon in the state countdown. Oh. <laughs> they, didn't, they also didn't call Ohio. Right. And uh, they spelled whales like the animal. <laughs> Other than that, this has been a really good icky paw. <laughs> and uh, I'm really uh, grateful that the uh, um, committee asked me to chair. Now they regret it. But... Uh, um, so yeah, uh, did I say, my, yeah, two twelve ninety four, and my home group is the Tuesday night Alberta men's meeting, which meets in Portland. Uh, so if you're a guy, an alcoholic, you're welcome to come. It's in a coffee shop, which is kind of sweet. And uh, yeah, I got asked because I am an atheist, and uh, so I guess I'll share a little experience how I came up with that, with this. And uh, um, so I actually grew up. My dad is. My dad is an atheist and was an atheist when uh, he raised me. My mom was more agnostic. Sometimes she uh, toyed around with hippie religions. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, um, so I didn't really have a lot of uh, influence from any kind of religion whatsoever. Um, once in a while, uh, we would do Passover with my dad's boss, and that was about it. And, uh, um, yeah, uh, so, um, you know, dr- you know, drinking, I... Uh, um, 
I got into drinking as why I'm here, and uh, um, you know, I ended up at an AA meeting, and all I heard in my first AA meeting, and I didn't really have any resentments against religion, and, that, and the, the religious people I kind of knew in my life, some of them were really cool people, and a couple of them were super annoying, but no one, you know, I didn't really understand the world, and didn't really understand, like, you know, so I didn't have, like, the resentment against uh, religion, but when I went to my first meeting, all I heard was, what, 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 God, what, 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 higher power, what, 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 sunlight of the spirit. And uh, I was just like, oh, this is spooky. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and I'm grateful that uh, other than the talk of, of God and higher powers and broad highways walking hand in hand with some dude and uh, was that they had coffee and cigarettes. And I, uh, there was a meeting, there was a club in Portland that for a long time they allowed smoking. And so I knew when I was on the streets to go there for, for cigarettes and coffee and uh, um so I would go and I would bum cigarettes, drink coffee, sometimes use their bathroom to use um, substances and, and drink. I, I remember uh, uh, I got asked to chair and I was holding this big uh, big gulp cup with which was half vodka and I was like, I don't think that's such a good idea. <laughs> and uh, um, so you know later um, when I hit my bottom, I uh, you know a bunch of really bad stuff happened and and it just you know other people's best thinking kept putting me in treatment centers. And I ended up in uh, uh, Louisiana, of all places, and uh, at a treatment center. And I drank for two weeks. And uh, there had been a lot of more exciting things that happened to me that should have got me into Alcoholics Anonymous. There were a lot of horrible, horrific things that should have gotten me into Alcoholics Anonymous. But the thing that got me into Alcoholics Anonymous is for two weeks of drinking, alcohol did not work for me. You know, I felt uh, the shame, the fear, mostly the fear, the guilt, and uh, I felt like me, even though I was slurring my speech, pissing my pants, and, and uh, um, tripping over shit. And, uh, you know, and, and so I'm in this treatment center, and I look out the, the window, and uh, I would see all these people that were, like, super stoked about AA, and uh, they were skipping around, and flowers were growing wherever they stepped, and... Uh, uh, <laughs> I didn't really necessarily want what they had, but I did definitely did not want what I had. And so I went to a meeting, um, and it was like the, 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 you had to go to the night meetings, but the noon was optional, so all the AA nerds were, were going to that one. And uh, so I went and got my uh, Keep Coming Back coin and got a sponsor and worked the steps. And when it came to the second step, at that particular time, I was desperate because I was so sick of living the way that I was living that um, – when he said, is there something greater than yourself? And I said, I, there better be because I, there's no way that I, I have, this has to work for me because I don't think I can do any more drinking. And I want to drink and I don't want to drink at the same time. I'm super confused. And uh, um, so I just said yes. And when it came to the third step, I just said, okay, well, let's do the rest of the steps. You know, and uh, um, so for the first few years, I really did have, I, I didn't have like a, um, a particular face to the to the name God or anything like that, but I, you know, I was pretty close to agnostic, but I believed in something was was helping me get sober, and I even had a, a, a some sort of weird experience on my seventh step, and and it felt that was the first time that not only did it, when I did my seventh step, I felt a part of Alcoholics Anonymous because I had done the finished the fourth step, did that fifth step, and then went out and did that prayer for an hour, and that was when I walked back. I remember I was like, oh, I'm a part of Alcoholics Anonymous now. And, uh, you know, and that, that, that was my spiritual experience, if you will. And, and uh, um, you know, so years later, um, I, I uh, um, you know, I, I struggled with, with the – I am not one that had the uh, obsession to drink removed immediately. It took about three years of, like, really wanting to drink super bad. And, uh, um, you know, luckily for me, there was always a little bit more of me that wanted to stay sober – and, uh, you know, I heard this said a few times at some of the other panels is like one of the few things I've done right in my entire sobriety is I always show up to Alcoholics Anonymous no matter what, including when shit's really bad because, you know, at 16 and a half years sober, I should be a little bit on top of life by now. And 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 when things are super good, you know what I mean? And like because uh, like some, you know, I've I've had friends that have like. They've got everything they wanted, and they just don't come back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And they got rocketed right through the fourth dimension, right into a bar. And, uh, um, you know, and, and that's, that's just the, so for me, I have to show up no matter what. And uh, um, so one day I woke up, and uh, I, I just really felt like there was no God. And that was really confusing. And, uh, um, and, you know, and that has kind of evolved into me 
believing in the proof that there is no God, and that's what atheism means. And for me, um, keep it down. Just kidding. Uh, neighbors. Uh, um, so, you know, that, they took a, a, it took a process to figure out because there's these 12 steps and they mention, um, in different words sometimes God in them. And, uh, you know, and, and so I'm going to discuss a little bit about, uh, I've, you know, I actually had someone like three weeks ago talk to me and, and about this cause they were struggling with this thing. And, uh, so, my, you know, my whole thing about being an atheist and working the steps, it has a lot to do with, um, uh, the uh, uh, what words mean and like and, and you know it, it took a long time to be able to sit in a meeting and have someone who is real spiritual you know like believe maybe even religious and when they say what they're saying I actually can relate and use what they're saying into my own life and 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 the thing for me is like I don't have faith in something I have faith in the process of the twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous you know and that is what my higher power is is the process. Because when I got sober, that it was the process, the 12 steps, the going to meetings, having a sponsor, working with others, joining service work that has not only got me sober but has kept me sober, you know, because nothing else had, had worked. I had tried um, uh, religion. I have tried therapy. Yeah, I, one time I uh, on a 10 strip of acid, I went to Jesus Christ Northwest, <laughs> and uh, I was moved. We were just there because there was a half pipe, you know. <laughs> There was a half pipe, so we went, and we were like, well, we can hang out with Christians, but they have a sweet half pipe out there. And uh, so um, anyway, they were like, does anybody else want to come up and, and give yourself? And I'm just tripping balls. And, and uh, <laughs> so I go up, and there's thousands of people there, and they were so stoked. And I remember looking out there. I mean, it was a spiritual experience, that's for sure. And uh, so anyway, that was my, my one time that I did get religious. But uh, uh you know, so for me, it's like, um, and, and, and the other thing is, is the practical, uh, the practical use of the steps, you know, like the big, the big question I get is, well, so you don't pray and meditate. Well, I absolutely pray and meditate, you know, um, um, the thing that, you know, there's a saying that a lot of people say that they, you know, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual. Well, actually my belief system, I believe a little more in religion than I do in spirituality because, the thing that I noticed about the, all the different religions is that um, it's all about um, community and rituals. And, and that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is to me. It's the rituals and the community, you know. I surround myself with people that, are, that love me and that are loyal to me. And, and, and I return that in kind. And I go to meetings. I do a little chant before the meeting. And we listen to how it works. And, like, you get used to all the different quirks that of your, of your particular meetings but you know so there's all these quirks at the particular meetings i go to those are the rituals and then i am surrounded by this community of people that their whole exist their whole ability to stay is them loving me and me loving them back and uh so i mean that's that's where my belief system is you know and and prayer for me is these little mantras you know i use the 11 step prayer I'll, I'll pretty often because those are things that i want to practice the, the, those principles on a, on a daily basis, you know, and, and, uh, um, you know, and, and the, all the other little prayers and just saying things in my head that's going to, or out loud, I actually pray out loud too. You know, I'm not, I know that's not going anywhere. I don't, I don't believe in something receiving it, but the thing is, it's like, it's in my head now. And then in the meditation, I pretty much just use the 11 step part in the uh, big book where like on awakening I, I do these certain things and on going to bed I do these certain things and then um, when I'm you know during the day I might have some problems I need to pause when agitated and 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 uh, that's meditation you know and and that is focusing my my uh, what I'm doing on the day you know sometimes I'm going totally right field and I'm getting pissed off I need to pause and I need to look at where I'm doing wrong and that's medit that's just meditation, you know. So even as an atheist, I'm able to use prayer and meditation as a as a tremendous tool in my sobriety. And uh um you know, the other thing that uh and I wanted to talk about is is how as an atheist, um, you know, I, I go to meetings and when I first became atheist, I uh I shared about it a lot. <laughs> and uh um Sometimes not in a very kind and loving way or love and tolerant, you know, way. And uh, there was always someone that had to talk to me after the meeting. So it was like, a, it, you know, I went back and forth and stuff. And, and uh, 
you know, and after, after a little while I came up or I, you know, through talking with my sponsor and some other people and some, some people that I know that have more time than me, that are also atheists, you know? So when I share it, when I personally share in a meeting, like I, a lot of times do not, like I use the word God, to, you know, I use like, you know, you know, uh, tr- Trust God, uh, clean house, and help others. I say that all the time in my shares, you know, and I make sure that I just say God and and uh, um, and leave it at that. Because like, as a newcomer walking into this room, you know that they they haven't had the experience yet. And in the twelfth step is having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And there's some other stuff after that. But uh, uh, <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like I didn't get to the part where I understood that I was an atheist and that I could use these certain principles in my life until I had practiced the 12 steps several times and I came up with a personal power greater than myself that works for me and and so I try to stay in a pretty general way when I share in meetings because a the the alcoholic who comes in may hear me talking about how atheism is the best there's no god grow up you know I don't believe in god because I'm actually smart and all, you know all that stuff and that guy is going to miss out on his own ex- – that person is going to miss out on the, uh, his, his or her own experience thinking that, that well, obviously I'm going to you – know, you know, I don't know what they're going to do. You know, it's, like, it's like one of those things. But the thing is it's like I want that person to have their own experience. It's like the whole like, oh, you have, uh, you have five years. I thought so. That's why you're depressed. You know, like the whole like let the person have their own experience. You know what I mean? Like – I, I, I just, I, you know, it's like, oh, you have 16 years? Yeah, that's why you're going through that. I did that, too. You know, it's like, well, let me have my own experience, or you're, you're about to hit the shit storm at 17 years, you know? And uh, it's just like, oh, great. Well, I, you know, things were kind of bad this year. I can't wait till next year. Oh, fuck. So, um, so for me, it's like sharing about anything, you know, like uh, sharing about... Uh, uh, you know, sharing about uh, drugs in a meeting, you know, it, when an al- person walks in and they, ha- and you're just sitting up here like, or I'm sitting up here like, I just shot so much heroin and, and uh, was doing all kinds of terrible things to get it. And that is just an alcoholic who's just drank. They're like, well, I obviously have to do heroin to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm, I'm going to go out <laughs> until I, I do the heroin thing and then I'll check them out. You know, I'm, and I'm not trying to, you know, lecture anybody, but I'm just saying for me personally, to be of maximum service to the alcoholic who walks in this room, I got to share in a general way. And one of those things that I have to do is keep the atheism in check. But that doesn't mean that if I'm in a room and I feel that um, talking about my personal experience with, with the higher power and, and coming to the conclusion that there is no God, then I will. And, and that's just like one of those things that I have to like make that decision. Um, and there was some other point that some brilliant point I had in my head that I was going to talk about. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I don't know. It's it's uh, it's been a, a um, my you know, in, in this whole thing that I just talked about with the uh, um, finding out how to use prayer meditation, finding out how to use uh, how to you know what how to share meetings and, and stuff like that. It's actually been pretty recent, and so I'm pretty fortunate that it wasn't until like I didn't share last year at Icky Paw on this panel because it would have been a completely different story. You know what I mean? And and because uh, um, I would I, I would be ready for an argument. I would be setting people up to come up after the after this meeting to argue with me, and that's not what I'm here. This is my experience. This is how I came to. And if some newcomer here has, is, is struggling with the idea of God, I just want to put out that the option is that you don't need to believe in anything now and maybe later. And that, you know, I'm also totally open. Someone was talking about how their sponsor after like 20 years of being a, an atheist had like a religious experience and joined a religion. And you know, I'm open to that happening to me. I'm actually sometimes when I'm in a meeting and everybody gets really, um, real spiritual and talking about that kind of stuff. Sometimes I do feel a little jealous that I don't have that 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 output and and stuff like that. But uh, um, you know, and so if you're new, if there's anybody new here and anybody at their new, first conference, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Welcome to Icky Paw. You know. Um, I, I was really nervous before I came up here, and, and I was trying to remember that, you know, Anaheim, California was my first icky paw, and I think I didn't wear clothes half the time, and <laughs> I got told to stop having sex in an elevator, and how, like, now I'm just like, I'm going to speak on AA stuff, and I'm super nervous, you know, and, and uh, 
I don't understand. Like the older I get, the, like the more shy and, and bashful I get. But uh, um, I, w- I kind of miss the days that I would just be able to take my clothes off and not really care what people thought of me. But uh, uh, maybe that's growth. Maybe that's not. But uh, yeah, just again, welcome to anybody that's new, and, and uh, hopefully you got something af- out of what I said. And uh, have a good time. Thanks. Our next panelist to share his own experience uh, yeah, from New York City is Aaron C. My name is Aaron. I'm an alcoholic. Um, yeah, I've been sober for about six years. I live in New York. I'm from Seattle originally. Um, usually I don't talk about my personal beliefs too much in meetings, but I guess this is the panel to do that. So I'm an atheist. There's usually more shock value when I say that. But I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. But uh, And when I first came to meetings, it really freaked me out when people were talking about God. I relate a lot to what Dave was saying. It's pretty much all I heard. Um, I also heard that I was supposed to get a sponsor. So I tried to get a sponsor, and we started talking for a few minutes, and he's like, so how do you feel about the higher power thing? And I told him, I said, I want the group to be my higher power, because I'd heard people say that, and it sounded like a good solution. And he said, okay, we can we can do that for starters. And he said it as if, like, somehow I was going to grow up and learn how to believe in God. And I never came back. I never came back to meet with him again. Um and I had a few experiences like that. And the only reason I think it's important that we talk about being atheist or agnostics is for there's plenty of people that come into the rooms and are freaked out by the word God. Lots and lots of people. So that's my personal beliefs really don't matter. The only reason they matter is that someone else might feel more comfortable when they hear them. And if you talk about God in a meeting, you're going to hear, this is for new people really, but you're going to hear a lot of people say a lot of things to you afterwards like, they're going to say, even if you don't believe in God, he believes in you, or stuff like that. And they, like a lot of people believe, I don't, I pray all the time. And when I pray, I don't believe God's listening. I don't believe it gets messed around with somewhere in the universe and something happens. I think that the, the, the whole, it all happens within my head, but it works. And like before I got up here, I'm still nervous. When I, before I got up here, I was praying the whole time, you know, like, It's just what I do. The most important thing that anyone ever told me in AA, because I was talking about this problem, I was like, I'd been sober for about two years, and I just wasn't happy, and I didn't want to be in AA, and I blamed it on God. I was like, I can't do this whole God thing. I don't like the whole God thing. I'm not going to do this. And it was really simple, and this guy said to me, it was actually Janish, the guy who was rapping on stage yesterday. And he said to me, I have a friend who is a complete atheist, and he's got 19 years sober, and you can talk to him. He did it. I was like, okay. He's like, well, you realize like, you can talk to him and try and do it, and if you don't want to do that, then that's not the problem. And something else is the problem. And that's really, that really changed everything, because you have people, three people right here with plenty of sobriety, who are working the program and have, you know, improved their lives. And if other people can do it, then you can do it. And I was raised, I was raised religious. I was raised as an Orthodox Jewish kid in Seattle. And I prayed when I was a kid, but it wasn't, I prayed out of guilt. I prayed at night for sick people and I'd listen to NPR in the car with my dad and like whenever there was warfare somewhere, I'd pray for them, and I'd pray really hard, because I'd feel guilty if I didn't, like something was going to happen to them, based on that. And, like, my prayer now is different. I pray, I only pray for, like, willingness, acceptance, strength, and I pray for other people, and I don't think that it's going to help them, <laughs> but I pray for them, because if I really, really, really focus on wishing what's best for them, or what God's will is for them, then it removes my resentments. And it's worked time and time again. The first time I prayed 
in sobriety, I was uh, I was a little over two years sober, and I was sitting outside of my class in college, and I was just thinking about drinking and smoking, like I just had been thinking about it the whole the whole time, and there wasn't anybody else around, and I was like, whatever, I'm gonna try this, and I was like, God, please, like please, please, please remove the obsession. I, obsession. I just said it over and over and over again. I was like, give me the strength to like not be obsessed, whatever. And I just kept saying it, and it. And it went away. You know, like, since then, like, gone. Like, of course, there's moments where I've thought about it. It's come back based on, you know, what else I'm doing in my life. But, like, it was pretty much gone from that point on. And now I pray every morning. Like, I have a routine. Like, the last two train stops, like, I pray, like, super hard. The walk to work, I pray. And, like, I really, really go at it. And it works. And it's, like, the only thing that brought me, like, any serenity and the only thing that removed the obsession. And I really related to what Dave said also about the community and ritual. Like, I don't believe in any of the books that come out of these religions, but having something that you do every day and having people that you relate to and communicate with and that really care about you is a super important thing. And, like, that's what fellowship is and that's what service is. And I try and do all those things. And I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all the panelists on behalf of the host committee. Um, we have plenty of time, so we, we are going to open it up. I'm going to ask that if you do raise your hand and you're chosen to share, that you step up to the podium. Um, reason being is that we are recording, and uh, we need you to speak into the microphone. Um, we're looking for security volunteers after the main uh, speaker meeting tonight. Uh, that's after 10 o'clock. If you are available, um, please go to the, the service booth and, and volunteer there. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm going to open it up and I'm going to let uh, Steve, Dave. I'm gonna, Dave's going to you know, pick one of you fine people to, uh, to share and come up here. Hi, everyone. I'm Malcolm. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I was really fascinated by what... Uh, so what's your name again? Eric? Aaron. Aaron. Aaron um, said about prayer. Because that's, I mean, that's something that I've always believed, is that prayer is not necessarily... You don't have to believe in God. It's a cognitive process. Um, the spiritual awakening is a cognitive process. Um, my spiritual awakening for me is when I s perceive things differently, I react differently. Um, you know, my sort of uh, subconscious things that force me to drink and do all this stuff are sort of at bay. It's funny, this sort of idea of atheism versus agnosticism. I mean, I do pray, which for my family is a very fairly radical thing. My father, my father was raised in the Church of England, and sort of thinks that if you teach, you know, teaching a child that God exists is tantamount to child abuse because God doesn't exist. And my mother's a little more agnostic. And I, I've become very faithful. I pray, um, and I sort of believe in God, but whenever I talk about it out loud, I feel really stupid. Because, I mean, if you look at it sort of in an objective sense, it's probably, and this is my opinion, not the position of Alcoholics Anonymous, obviously, but if you look at it objectively, it's probably not real. I mean, it's a little silly, actually. If you look at it, if you say it out loud, but part of um, faith is it's you can't think of it like that. It's not sort of a logic thing. It's not a science thing. You know, you're not applying the scientific method to this. You're doing something with the belief that it'll make you better, and you're praying to God to get out of yourself. Um, and that's what I do, and I find it incredibly rewarding. Um, I read a. I uh, I was reading um. Uh, the Walt Whitman, one of Walt Whitman's poems from uh, Leaves of Grass, is called Prayer for Columbus or something. 
and it's all it, it goes on and on about um, him, you know, all the things he's done. And at one point towards the end, and I've made this in the little box on my Facebook home. It's in that little box now, that quote box. There's, it's a line towards the end of the poem. It says uh, something like, I'm going to get this wrong, but, oh, Lord, these things I see, what are they? And I find myself saying that constantly in both times when I am feel crazy or depressed or compulsively acting out in a way or... Um, and in times of like great joy, you know, we, whatever it is, whether it's the, you know, the infinite incomprehensible nature of our universe, the world around us, the simple things, whether it is God, there's sort of these incredible things that I can constantly in sobriety open my eyes up to, you know, sort of can close my eyes and then open up and these things I see, what are they? Even if they're clear, it's, it's miraculous. Anyway, uh, thank you. Thank you, panelists. You guys were great. Steve, could you select someone? Oh. We're on it. We got it, Mike. You're next. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I don't really like microphones. This is kind of weird. But, um, yeah, I wasn't planning on coming to this meeting. I just know someone speaking and know the guy chairing it. So I came. Um, but I'm really glad I came here because um, I was just sitting here and Steve, you were, Steve, when he was sharing, um, I I guess I, I've not finished working the steps yet. I have um, like a little over a year and a half sober and um, I procrastinate like I'm sure a lot of you guys do. Um, but the whole God thing always freaked me out. And I, it's like I, I try and I don't say God. And when people say it, it freaks me out. Um, I say higher power, um, if anything at all. Uh, but when Steve shared, I, my sponsor's sitting in front of me and I was like, hey, I'm like, that's exactly how I feel. And I, I guess I, I was always afraid, not that I don't feel comfortable telling anybody. I just didn't know if that was okay in this program that I had to like accept it. Um, but I guess I don't, and that's pretty cool, and I'm really glad I came here. But um, I, I get, like, spiritual feelings. I don't necessarily, like, pray to one thing. I get feelings of things that make me feel like there's hope. Um, like, I feel the most happy when I'm riding my bike and there's, like, wind, and that's when I kind of connect with whatever it is that I, I like. It's, it's more that I'm aware of things like that I wasn't aware of when I was using and stuff. And that in itself, I think, is a lot. Um, and I don't know, I'm just really glad I came to this meeting because I think it gave me a lot of clarity on a higher power and God thing and that it's okay to not believe in it. Um, but, yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Liz. I'm an alcoholic. That's not really my name, but that thing is recording. Um, <laughs> there might be some people who know me. Um, no, I'm from Brooklyn. Th- uh, thanks for coming to our city, and thanks for calling me. Um, yeah, I'm an atheist, and this is my first agnostics atheist meeting, and I got sober on February 6, 2006. Um, so my sponsor told me whenever there's the subject of God or atheism in a meeting for me to raise my hand and talk about it. And that's hysterical. Um, so I got sober in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, there you are at the Allen Oak Club. And, uh, and I had to share, it was a big book meeting, 1215 on, Fridays, I think is the big book, or Tuesdays, and it's a two and a half hour meeting, and we, everyone talks, and you talk as long as you want, and you read a paragraph, and then you talk, and uh, every time there was God in the big book, or whatever, that was the subject, I had to raise my hand and say, I'm, I'm an alcoholic, um, and I'm not Christian, and then I'd share, and that, that was pretty awesome, (laughs) 
And then as I came to Brooklyn, I learned like there's a lot of non-Christians and, and they're very spiritual and, and they annoy me um, because I'm pretty religious. And, uh, and so that's pretty cool. But, um, so my first sponsor got sober in the seventies and she said it took a year to do a step. And about the third time we met, she said, now what is God to you? You have to answer that question next time we meet. So I, someone in my religious community forwarded me to someone else who had gotten sober five years before. And I asked him like, what the hell do I do with this program? And he said, yeah, you'll figure it out. And uh, what he was saying is that, the, as the guy said, it is a process and that it's an amazing process. And um, what else do I want to say? And I still have people, I, I say I'm, I'm atheist and I'm religious, and they come up to me afterwards and they tell me what they think. And um, now I do service, so I'm learning more how to handle people with their opinions. So that's awesome. Um, but, yeah, so this... This, uh, uh, and I have, oh, so now I did the 12 steps and I have sponsees and they both believe in God and in meetings. I talk in the AA language. I use the word God and, and then I make a joke. I'm an atheist, but it's like, I, you know, and people laugh and I'm like, no, seriously. And, uh, it's like when I do a job interview, I always swear I say shit in the job interview because then they know what they're getting. They're getting this personality. They're not getting something else. So I use the A language, but I give the disclaimer, like I'm an atheist. And then people try to convince me to go to an agnostic meeting, and that kind of scares me. So I just wanted to come up and give a shout-out to the homies, and thanks for the atheist meeting. I'm Sarah, I'm an alcoholic, also from Portland, Oregon. I hear we're getting a shout out tonight. Um, so I also am an atheist. I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir. The, you know, and I've run the gambit between agnostic and trying to believe and struggling and also feeling like, you know, my problem is that because I don't, I don't believe in Jesus. And if I, if I believed in Jesus, the magic willingness fairy would come down and, like, bop me over the head, and I would become an AA robot and do everything perfectly always and, like, want to. And, you know, I was fortunate in that I had a sponsor who quit coming to AA, and so I just had to randomly pick someone because I started to get kind of crazy. And she, like, believes in Jesus, which I didn't know because I didn't... <laughs> had in the past always um, picked picked lesbians because they usually, you know, believe in goddess and Wicca and a bunch of hippie shit that I didn't, you know. So they would never push me to, to get a higher power, really. You know, and I did the, the same thing, the group and the process of the steps and all that. And so I was telling this to my new um, straight sponsor who believes in Jesus, and she was like, no, it's just as hard for us. And you have to get a higher power, which was new. You know, I've been sober nine years, and no one had ever told me, you have to get a higher power. And she's like, and it doesn't have to be Jesus, and it's not. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing that's always been really, really good for me is Appendix to the Spiritual Experience, which is not part of the first 164 pages. So I find that there are people who may not have read it. And in the first <laughs> I know, isn't that crazy? In the first paragraph, it defines a spiritual awakening or a spiritual experience as a personality change of sufficient force to bring about recovery from alcoholism. And that's what it is for me. You know, it's the process of working the steps. I get that spiritual awakening, which is a personality change. Thanks. Sorry. I'm Ben. I'm an alcoholic. I really wanted to speak. This is my favorite topic. Um, so uh, it's really nice to be here in a room of godless heathens. Um, I, I actually kind of avoid the agnostic AA meetings because 
Generally, I find them in a room full of people all congratulating themselves about how smart they are. <laughs> and it's been really nice to hear a little more than that. And um, I related to a lot that I heard. Uh, I also never really liked it when, you know, I'd hear like, oh, don't worry if you're an agnostic or an atheist because we were too once. And it's like, well, but I don't, I don't want to become you. That's okay. Um, I guess... Um, but the but the the kind of the reason I'm in this religious cult is because I guess we've all kind of realized that it's the only way out. We have to be here. We have, as they say, we have a, a choice between dying a spiritual death and living by spirit or dying an alcoholic death and living by spiritual principles. It's kind of a tough choice. But um, I guess by spiritual principles, what I've come to realize is that it isn't necessarily this sort of supernatural mumbo jumbo stuff that I've always really resisted. But I think part of it is just sort of an awareness of how you act and how you live your life. And um, I think that one of the reasons I'm happy that I haven't sort of cloistered myself with just the agnostics is that this group has given me, it's, it's really helped me kind of see that I also have this urge to offend people who disagree with me or see things differently. Um, I really liked it when you said, I don't believe in God because I'm smarter than everyone else. I really related to that, but you shouldn't have said it. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's been really nice to hear from some like-minded people. Um, thank you. I'm Janice, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Hi. So, obviously, I'm from the South, where um, big old Bible Belt and all that stuff, but, um, right? Um, really religious upbringing, you know, and I thought I was going straight to hell um, once I hit college. Um, I made before, but, um, so, anyway, um, I guess I have, like, just this, like, searching process, um, which I've heard people say, like, it's like a searching thing and not really, like, a destination, you know, you're just kind of searching fumbling around for it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've heard, like, it's, like, good orderly direction, group of drunks, like, grow or die. And um, I kind of think that's my definition of, of God is, like, um, whatever helps me to breathe instead of holding my breath. Because I feel like when I was drinking, I felt like I was holding my breath all the time. And um, when I would drink, I would feel like I could finally take a deep breath and breathe. Um and so I think, uh, it's funny because I think somewhere, like, spirit, there's some kind of definition that says that it's like breath, basically. Um, and so, uh, that kind of makes sense to me that whatever, if it is, you know, and also I had this crazy little notion, and sometimes I, I don't know if this is, I play around with this idea, like, God's gonna help me find a parking space, or, like, God's gonna, you know, just, uh, work his mojo so that I'll win the lottery. Um, you know, but, uh, I don't know about that, like that the light changes. So I get to a meeting faster. Um, but I don't know, like, I, I think that's a bunch of crap, but, um, <laughs> but it works for some people. They're like, if I pray hard enough or, you know, if, if God is like karma or something, but you know, it's really none of my business. Like I learned when I did my fist up that a lot of stuff is really just none of my business. Like my resentment towards, half the world and people's families for bringing them up wrong and stuff. Like that's none of my business, you know? Um, (laughs) but so, um, I'm a wackadoo if I don't come to this program, I'm a straight wackadoo, um, with a Southern accent, you know, which doesn't make it any better. It's just still wackadoo, you know, um, crazy, like straight crazy. Um, and I think, uh, whatever it is that just helps me breathe and like be nicer to people and not just like fake, happy, sunny, Southern hospitality nights to people, but like truly able to like sit and listen and not, um, not think about myself, um, is, is all right, you know? So I think if there is like something out there or whatever, it's just something that is just like, you know, you're okay. And that's what I feel when I come to these rooms, I can breathe, I can like hang out and be nice. And, um, and help other people and, um, and just say that it's going to be all right. So, um, thank y'all. Have a nice day. Hi, 
I'm Olivia. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'm from Texas, but I got sober in Boston. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, I love this topic also. I forgot which one of you said it, but um, somebody was talking about how working the steps, they had to pick apart the words rather than um, look at it as a whole. And um, for me, whenever I was working the second step, it was really important for me to, um, to look at exactly what it meant. And it just meant that I needed a higher power to keep me sane. Um, and it didn't matter what that was. Somebody told me one time that it could be my shoe if I wanted it to be, um, which kind of helps me understand that it didn't matter. Like, I didn't have to find the religion that made the universe and um, figure out the secrets of the world, but I just needed to figure out something that was bigger than me. Um, and I've heard people say that, you know, their sponsors made them, like, stand in the ocean and try to stop a wave, or um, one sponsor said that, like, <laughs> was that you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I've heard other people um, talk about their sponsors um, telling them to run around outside naked and see if somebody um, takes them down. Um, the police. Yeah. Um, and so that just it helps me see that, um, you know, I'm not my own God and there's there's something that is bigger than me and I don't have to know what that is right away. Um, and, you know, I believe that there's like a God-shaped hole in all of us, and it doesn't matter what it is because it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. Nobody has the same exact conception of what their higher power is. Um, and so it's really important for me to, um, to always remember that I don't have to have a religion. I don't have to believe in um, a cookie-cutter shape of um, what God is, and um, I just have to have something to pray to. Um, and for me, whenever I pray, it's um, I just kind of pray so that I can change my perspective about things. Um, you know, if I'm praying for someone else or if I'm praying to stay sober, then, um, then it's a thought that I think about. And, um, and my sponsor told me in my like first 30 days that, um, I was really angry at the girl I live with. And, uh, and she was like, you need to pray for this person for the next, um, 24 days. So, you know, day one, I start praying. I'm like, I pray this girl falls off a cliff tomorrow. I pray this girl eats poison and dies. Um, but you know, by the end of it, I was just kind of like over it and it was just, you know, like it's totally fine. And it completely changed my perspective. Um, so that's also really, um, it's important for me to pray and say thank you at the end of the day. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say. Maybe that's it. All right. (laughs) Thanks for keeping me sober today. Hi, everybody. My name is Jim. I'm an alcoholic. Um, It's really good to be here, and I'm going to try to say all of the things that I have to say in a few moments. Um, I haven't been to a young people's, uh, uh, to an ikipa in a long time, and uh, it's really, really good to be here. Um, I was brought up in a very religious family. My mom uh, had us going to church every day, every day, every every week. Uh, I was a pianist when I was a kid. And I would play for the Sunday school, and uh, so it was church all the time. I remember going to this retreat with my mom, and uh, we got in a room, (laughs) this woman, and uh, and they were praying over me. And the one, the woman put her hand on my on my head, and and I was to feel the spirit. And I was this kid; I was 11 or 12 or however old I was, and. and it was ridiculous. And I was like, this is not, I'm not feeling anything. This is stupid. And then I started to cry. And she said, he's feeling it. He's feeling it. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, let's go with that. Um, and I started to do that, that lying thing that, you know, figuring out what people wanted to hear and, and, and doing that. Um, I joined the military, which was a bad idea because I'm not really a military-minded person, but I wanted whatever it was that I wanted. It was during the be-all-you-can-be era. And uh, 
I got drunk and I went AWOL and I tried to kill myself and uh, life happened and uh, eventually they sent me to AA. And in AA, um, they said a bunch of shit that made sense to me. Um, and then there was this God thing. But what they said was, you can choose your own conception of a God. And I was like, all right, well, I can choose one that, that isn't ridiculous like my mom, and this is great. So I did that, and it worked for me. And then I realized, I went through the steps, and I realized that my problem with religion when I was a kid was I didn't like these people telling me what to do. Um, I don't like people telling me what to do. It doesn't matter whether it's an organized religion or not. I don't like it. Um, and AA didn't do that for me. At the, in the, time, when I, the way that I was looking at it, AA was saying, you choose your own conception, you know, to do this. And that was really good for me. And I went with it, and I ran with it, and I, I would, AA was AA, and it was great. And I came back home, and I started talking to Mom about higher power, and we, we got this close relationship because we had a similar spirituality where she was talking about this dude, and I was talking about this other dude. And, and I was clear that it was the same dude, and she was kind of clear it was the same dude. But about four, five, six years ago, uh, I kind of, I had no idea how to continue to live my life. I, I wasn't, I was sponsoring everybody and I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was, that I had anything to give anymore. I didn't feel like I, I could be telling folks what, what they should be doing. And I was saying honest things in, in meetings like, I don't know what you should do, but maybe, you know, and this is what I did. And I, and, and so more people wanted me to sponsor them. So, uh, I kind of started to pull away from AA maybe about a year and a half ago, I was, uh, I'm still a musician in churches, and, uh, and I was at church with a buddy of mine that, uh, that, that goes to church, that's in AA, and I said, thank you, and I said, um, after, the, after the service, I said, Pat, none of this makes sense. Like, I know that I'm singing, and these people are being touched by it, and that's great, but it's dumb. None of this God stuff makes any sense. And he said, yeah, I can feel that. What does make sense? And that was brilliant for me. Because um, for me, I realized that the idea of no God made no sense. To, the idea of God made no sense to me. And the idea of no God made no sense to me. And I was left with this thing of, I don't know, which is what I've always felt. I've always felt like, None of us know. None of us are right. Um, I went to uh, the convention in San Antonio. A friend of mine uh, got me down there. Uh, I hadn't been to a meeting in about a year and a half. And I went to the agnostic meeting and uh, met up with these people afterwards. And we talked. And I have to shut up. But while I was there, I had this feeling of I can, I can search this path of no God, which makes no sense to me, um, in AA. And, uh, and I, I don't know, I'm just really grateful that this is here and uh, for your speakers and for your leading and for you guys to be here. Thanks. Alex. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm an alcoholic. I know we all want to get out of here, so I won't try to go off on a tangent. Um, thanks, guys, for speaking. It's great to hear you. Glad to be at Ikipa. Welcome to New York. If this is your first time, welcome back if you've been here before. Um, yeah, I had a really crazy experience. You know, I, I came in uh, raging atheist. Um, culturally, I'm Catholic. Uh, spiritually, I, I don't know, maybe something different. Um, but, you know, um, I, I, I guess for me what I, what I wanted to contribute and share my experience is, um, you know, I got, you know, I'm a, you know, I like philosophy and I like to debate and I like to argue. And I think the thing for me is um, I got too caught up in linguistics and semantics and ideology and uh, right or wrong, you know. And I think what really helped me out was looking at it pragmatically is my way of life keeping me sober. 
is my way of life giving me soundness of mind as described in the second step, you know, when it talks about insanity? No. So, you know, it's like the same thing of like if I go into a carpentry shop and I'm pretty adamant, I know what the fuck I'm doing, but I don't, and I don't take anybody's words for it, like I'm going to do a pretty shitty job, you know. So it's like, you know, it, I, I related a lot to what Aaron spoke and I didn't plan on coming, but, you know, I know Aaron, he's a great guy. And uh, I really related what he said. It doesn't matter what I think. It's what I do, you know, and that's my own personal conception is that, um, you know, at the end of the day, I can talk, you know, Descartes or, you know, you know, because like I was an nihilist, you know, I didn't believe in anything. And like, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, it, it's it's what I'm doing on a daily basis to stay sober, you know, and, um, you know. I just feel like, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because it's like, you know, I've met some of the most religious people who've been the biggest hypocrites, you know, and I've met the most devout atheists who've been like some of the most spiritual people I've ever met. And, um, you know, it's kind of just like, what am I doing today? And have I stayed, you know, open minded to the fact that my way of life doesn't work? Um, and, you know, my second step experience then had nothing to do with God. You know, I was just walking down the street and it said, oh, my God, if I keep living life the way I have been living it, I'm going to get drunk. So let me try something else. You know, so it's not right or wrong or, you know, cuss, you know, kissing and hugging and fucking, you know, it's just like for better, or for worse. You know, is is this thing working or it's not? You know, it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like. Uh, what, is it? it's, what do they call it? They call it AA, uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's like, you know, it's all about the action, you know. Don't get caught up in the words or, you know, what you're going to turn into. It's like if you want to stay sober, uh, you know, you don't have to deal with the God stuff. And today I'm not a raging atheist and I don't, you know, I don't compartmentalize people for their beliefs. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's just like, you know, the 12 steps work. And that's it. And how you define God is, you know, it's like people, it's, it's fact from, you know, it's like fact and truth. It's like you can have your own truth, but the fact is that 12 steps work, you know. So thanks. Let me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.